Well, many of you know that I was a distance runner in college. I ran Division II cross country and track. And during my senior season, I had my eye on winning our cross country conference championship individually. So our conference had nine teams consisting of about 100 runners. And I also was looking to win the Southeast Regional Championship, which had over 20 teams and 200 runners. And the summer before the fall season and through the fall, I fully surrendered myself to training. This impacted what I ate when I went to sleep. I took ice baths after runs. I foam rolled my legs. I stretched. I lifted. And I ran hundreds of miles each month. And at times, I wanted to go out and watch a movie late with friends on a Friday night. But I said no because I needed to get good rest for my body to recover and prepare for early morning runs. I craved a gallon of ice cream, but instead, of keep, I, instead I kept eating healthy to properly fuel my body. And every decision I made was dictated and impacted by this commitment to training. I gave myself fully to this goal of winning these races and the hope of achieving the glory of becoming a champion. And race day came. I was ready, I towed the line, and I was prepared to win. Well, in our spiritual lives, we here on earth are in that same season that I was in training. We'll see today in our text that to follow Jesus, to be his disciples, we are called to fully surrender to him, to deny ourselves to follow him. So we're continuing our series, Walking Through the Gospel of Mark, Last week, Pastor Shane skipped a section of Mark, and we learned that disciples move from doubt to action, as that was a great message before we had our backyard bash. Today, we're going back to chapter 8. So from the very beginning of the book of Mark, in verse 1 of the whole book, we read that Jesus is the Son of God, meaning the Messiah, coming from Hebrew, or Christ, coming from Greek, meaning the anointed one of God, who would save and deliver the Jewish nation prophesied in the Old Testament. And we know that from the very beginning, who Mark views Jesus to be. We read on waiting for someone to answer the question, who is Jesus? Yet up until this point in chapter 8, the first half of the book, no one recognizes him. Except the demons, in spite of the series of events that demand a response. Jesus preaches the kingdom of God, he calls his disciples, he performs miracles, he casts out demons, he miraculously heals people. And we've seen how different people responded to Jesus' powerful acts and how they are wrestling with that question, who is Jesus? When Jesus forgives the sins and heals the paralytic in Mark 2, some scribes say, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In Mark 4, Jesus calms the storm and his disciples ask, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Then in Mark chapter 6, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth, and people say, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? All of Mark so far has been leading up to this turning point found in chapter 8, starting at verse 27. So turn with, I invite you to turn with me there, Mark chapter 8, verse, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So here, Jesus and his disciples are on their way. They're traveling to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they tell him, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others the prophets. But then Jesus asks them personally, but who do you say that I am? And Peter here, as the voice of all the disciples, answers, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the deliverer promised to the Jewish people. And then Jesus tells them to tell no one about him. And we'll learn later on a really good reason why Jesus said this. But let's continue reading in verse 31. And he began, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed 
and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So here Jesus then starts teaching them how he, right, the Son of Man, the Messiah, is going to fulfill his mission, right, that he must suffer, be killed, rise again three days. And Peter, and Peter brings Jesus aside and rebukes him. Right? The Messiah in Peter's mind and what popular belief in Peter's day by the Jewish people is that the Messiah would be a political leader, right, a deliverer, a king that would reign over all. So Peter takes Jesus aside and is telling him, Jesus, don't talk like that. You're the Messiah. You're the king. You're going to rule and put Rome in their rightful place. And also think about the disciples and discipleship during this time. Right? Disciples of rabbis during Jesus' day were trying to be like their teacher. Right? They would do what their teacher did. So another reason Peter doesn't want to accept what Jesus is saying is because that means right, the suffering is something that he will have to endure and face as well. But Jesus quickly corrects Peter. Right, telling him to get behind him, Satan, right, knowing that Peter's not setting his mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Phew, I wouldn't want to be uh, called Satan by Jesus. <laughs> but here, Jesus is helping Peter see the true picture of the Messiah. Right? Yes, Peter and the disciples have acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah, but they have a very different picture or idea of how Jesus will fulfill his mission as the Messiah. It's actually interesting to look back to the verses preceding Peter's confession about the story of Jesus healing the blind man at Bethesda, right? In Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, it was preached on a couple weeks ago. It tells us how Jesus put his hands on the blind man's eyes and asked him if he could see anything. Right? The man says he can see people, but they look like trees walking. Right? He has a blurry, partial, unfocused view, right? And then Jesus lays his hands on his eyes again, and the man could see clearly. So similarly, Peter had a blurry, partial, unfocused view of who the Messiah is. And Jesus is helping him see clearly by plainly telling them that the Messiah will suffer, be killed, and rise again three days later. We need to make sure we understand Jesus to be who he truly is. Do you know the biblical Jesus, the real Jesus? Or do you have preconceived thoughts about who you think Jesus is or should be, right, like Peter did? Does the culture we live in today impact who we see Jesus to be? Just like Peter was impacted by popular thought about who the Messiah would be and do, right, I encourage you to study the Bible, get to know the real Jesus, the biblical Jesus. Let's continue reading in our passage, picking up uh, on verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So Jesus now is addressing his disciples, but also the crowd that was obviously around them. He's saying that if anyone, all those who were there in the story and all of us readers today, if anyone wants to follow him, they must deny himself and take up their cross. And that's our big first point this morning. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. Many of us, many of us have heard this, uh, but what does this mean, denying yourself and carrying your cross? Right? The, the denying yourself is not simply limited to resisting a specific material thing. Right? It, means, it means renouncing the self, ceasing to make center, the self the center focus of one's life and actions. So our allegiance is not primarily, primarily to ourselves, but to Jesus. God, not to self, must be the center of one's life. 
Jesus is the one dictating and impacting every decision that we make. Just as in the same way that the goal of winning those championship races impacted my life during my training. Now, during my training, I did deny myself specific things, junk food, staying out late, right? But that was because I was fully devoted, fully committed, fully surrendered to the goal of winning. I was putting the cause, the goal first, before my personal wants. The goal of winning and achieving glory through becoming a champion mattered more than anything I had to sacrifice. And likewise, our lives will look differently once we have surrendered our life to Jesus. Right? We may deny specific things, but that's because we are surrendered to him. This means we will obey his commandments, we will flee sin, and we'll do what he says. Following him, obeying him, matters more than anything else. So Jesus says we deny ourselves and take up our cross. Now remember this account we're reading here today happened before Jesus was crucified on a cross. But the disciples and everyone that was listening to Jesus here were fully aware what taking up a cross was and meant. It was part of Rome's capital punishment where the worst criminals would have to carry the cross that would lead to their death. A picture of total submission. There's no going back, but they have no other option than to carry that cross. The picture is that to be a disciple of Jesus is to be fully surrendered, fully submitted to Jesus. We've heard the saying, well, that's just my cross to bear, you know, where someone has an issue or a problem or some type of sacrifice they have to make. But taking up your cross means you're fully surrendered, all of you, every aspect of your life given to Jesus. Jesus doesn't just want this part or that part of your life. He wants all of you. He wants you fully surrendered and submitted to him. Because of the free gift of salvation given to us through faith in Jesus' work on the cross, we're his. There's nothing he can ask that is too much of an ask of us. Whatever he asks, we will do. Even Even if he calls us to give up our lives We will do it. In verses 35 and 37, Jesus is saying that if you deny him, right, your physical life may be saved, but your spiritual life, salvation, will be lost. On the other hand, to lose one's physical life by remaining true to Christ, fully surrendered him, right, you can be assured you will have eternal life. You can have the whole world, but in the end, without trusting in Jesus, surrendering your life to him, you'll lose your soul. If you're ashamed of Jesus and refuse to follow him in cross-bearing discipleship, then you're choosing to reject him and will suffer shame and loss on the day of judgment. Let's keep reading in chapter 9, verse 1. And he, Jesus, said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now this verse is actually wrapping up the end of chapter 8, and transitioning us to the transfiguration. The sum of those standing here most likely refer to Peter, James, and John, who will be witnessing the transfiguration that we're about to read about. The word transfiguration means a change in form or appearance, an exalting, glorifying, or spiritual change. So the transfiguration here in Mark is the revelation of the glory of the Son of God, a glory that, that is now hidden but will be manifested completely at the end of the age when Jesus will reign and make all things right. Peter, who witnessed the event, later wrote in 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through 18, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God, the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So let's pick back up in our text, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make 
three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. So Peter takes, or Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up on top of a mountain where Jesus' glory is revealed. His clothes were radiant, whiter than anything anyone could even bleach. And appearing with Jesus is Elijah and Moses. Why these two? Well, what the disciples saw was a glimpse of Jesus' final state of glory. Moses and Elijah's function may be to announce the end. In Jewish expectation, Elijah clearly played that role. In some Jewish traditions, Elijah and Moses appear together as a sign of the coming end of the age. Another possibility is that Elijah and Moses represent the law and the prophets at the Old Testament, which was being fulfilled by Jesus. Moses can represent the law where Elijah represents the prophets. And also, both Moses and Elijah met with God and heard his voice on a mountain. Each man represents divine revelation and affirmation. And Peter mistakenly believes, right, he's witnessing the coming of the kingdom of God, the final coming, in response to seeing this with this odd comment of building tents for each of them. And theologians have speculated why he may have said this, uh, but we really don't need to look too far into it, especially this morning, because the next sentence, Mark tells us that he, Peter, did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Peter evidently, though, seeks the fulfillment of God's kingdom without the suffering which Jesus has been telling them about and that will come. We see that a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. God the Father speaking, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Right? And another affirmation and confirmation to the disciples that Jesus is the Messiah and he will fulfill his mission by suffering, dying, and rising from the dead. God the Father is telling the disciples, listen to him. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He's telling you what the path to glory will be. Will be. It's a path of self-denial and of sacrifice. And here the disciples experience God's presence and they see his glory. Jesus is revealed not only as the radiance of God's glory, as the sun affirmed by God himself, but they also survive it. Right? Jesus here is revealed not only as God, but as the means by which we can stand in God's presence without being destroyed. Jesus is the perfect mediator between man and God. And then we read in verse 8 that suddenly the disciples no longer saw anyone with them, only Jesus, Jesus standing alone as the culmination and fulfillment of the Old Testament revelation. It's a beautiful picture. Let's continue reading in verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So as they're coming down the mountain, Jesus tells them to tell no one what they've seen, to not tell that he is the Messiah, right, until he is risen from the dead. Remember that Jesus told the disciples earlier in this passage to tell no one that he was the Christ. One main reason Jesus tells them this is because Jesus is defining what the Messiah truly is and what he will do. He's not coming in, a, in politically and taking over rulership at this time, as this is what most people thought the Messiah would do and be. Right? He's telling them to wait until he's risen from the dead for them to proclaim to all the world that he is the Messiah, the Savior and deliverer, deliverer not only to the Jewish people, but of the world. But Peter, James, and John still question what this rising from the dead means. They still are not getting it. Instead of asking more about that specifically, right, they ask Jesus, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And Jesus answers them, answers them that the teacher of the law 
like they're right about Elijah. He will come first and restore all things. But whatever that involves, it does not prevent the suffering and the rejection of Jesus. Furthermore, Jesus asks, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Right? This mostly, most likely is an allusion to Isaiah 53.3, where the suffering servant is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It can also be an allusion to Psalm 118.22 that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the st- cornerstone. Jesus' statement here says that Elijah has already come. Right? It's referring to John the Baptist, right? and that they have done to him everything they wished, like referring to his treatment by Herod and his imprisonment and death. So even with this question about Elijah, right, Jesus is not going to let them get distracted or ignore the fact that he must suffer die, and rise again. This is how he will fulfill his messianic mission. So back to my college, collegiate senior cross-country season. The culmination of my collegiate college running career. I trained, right? I gave myself fully to the cause. The process of training for the glory of winning these championship races I denied myself, I sacrificed and did what was demanded of me and put the goal of winning these races above my own daily desires. And it was race day for the conference championship. I had a race with around 100 other competitors and the gun went off and I ran the best I had ever run. I ran over 30 seconds faster than I had ever run before. The race of my life. And as I crossed the finish line, I got second. And I lost by two seconds on a five-mile race. But two weeks later was the Southeast Regional Championship, a larger race that covered the entire Southeast region, 20 teams, around 200 runners. And I ran even better, beating the guy that beat me at the conference championships two weeks prior. And I ran over 50 seconds faster. This was a six over a six-mile race than I ever run that course. And I got second again. I had fully surrendered to the cause and the goal of winning, right? But I didn't achieve it. And to us that are really competitors, second is the first loser. <laughs> so, no, I had a great college career and I was, it, was a, it was a good thing. But the amazing thing, right, about our spiritual lives as Christians is that if you've trusted in Jesus and you've surrendered your life to him, then you're guaranteed glory, Unlike how my athletic training and efforts did not guarantee the glory of winning, spiritually speaking, we have the promise, the guarantee of glory in the life to come. Jesus is going to be glorified forever, and, and we will be with him in heaven forever. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, do you, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Do I ever? (laughs) Right? But it says, so run that you may attain it. And spiritually, we can attain the prize. That prize and glory is when when God tells us at the end of our life, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your Lord. So this brings us to our other big takeaway today, that in the end, Jesus is going to be fully glorified. He will reign forever, and we will be with him in glory. Hebrews 1, 3 says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Philippians 2, 9 through 13 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
we're looking forward to this time when Jesus is fully glorified, when he reigns forever, when we will be with him in glory, when he makes all things new. But right now, here on this earth, we're in this in-between time where we're waiting for God to make all things new. We're waiting for him to return and for the final glory. We're in this time of training, looking ahead to the future glory that awaits Jesus and those who have trusted in him, but right now are denying ourselves. Understand that we are fully surrendered, fully submitted to whatever Jesus may call us to do. That we, like Jesus, we're called to live a life of sacrifice and self-denial for the sake of others. We are here to love God, to love others, to make authentic followers of Jesus. These are difficult, self-denying things. Loving God and others takes sacrifice, giving of your time, your energy, your finances. It's denying what you personally want at times to meet the needs of others. Life's difficult. Sin is real. We're surrounded by wickedness and hurt. Thankfully, God has given us the Holy Spirit, his church, right, to help us do this. But it's training. It's an upstream, swimming kind of thing. It's radical and very different from our culture around us. All right, but there's hope for us today, right? Because we look ahead to the glory that Jesus will have and his reign over all in the end. So I want to encourage you who are following Jesus now, who have surrendered yourself to God, to keep pressing on. Right? Keep training. We have hope in the difficulties and sufferings of today because we have a bright, promised future ahead. For all of us today, just like Jesus asked Peter and the disciples, he's asking each of us, who do you say I am? Is Jesus just a good teacher that lived 2,000 years ago? A good philosopher? Or is he the Messiah, God who became man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for the sins of all mankind, and rose again three days later, conquering sin and death so that you could have a relationship with God, the Father, spend eternity in heaven and with him, and have a meaningful and mission-filled life here on earth. I encourage you to keep exploring, keep seeking, keep reading the Bible so you can answer that question for yourself, right? Because the answer to that question impacts your life here on earth and in the life to come. All right, if Jesus is your Savior and you are following him, that means you're fully surrendered to him. You're denying yourself. You take up your cross and you follow him. And Jesus will make all things right in the future. Jesus rarely did what people expected him to do. Even after Jesus rose again, conquering sin and death, I'm sure his disciples were still like, okay, now is the time Jesus is going to rule and reign on earth. We're ready. Go, Jesus, go. It's time. Right? But instead, we, we learn in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Now I give you the mission to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'm with you always to the very end. Jesus physically leaves and gives them the mission, gives us as his disciples today the mission to build his church. So church, to those of you right, who are trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior, who are denying yourselves and fully surrendered to him, who are enduring the suffering, who are training, right, I want to encourage you to keep pressing on, keep training, keep surrendering your all to Jesus. Glory is coming. Let's pray. Father, we just, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your word that we can learn about who you are. Who, we can answer that question, who is Jesus personally? I pray for anyone here today that is still grappling with that decision personally, that they can continue to dive in and recognize who you are. I pray that we can be fully surrendered to you, fully committed to the cause that you've given us to love God, to love others, and to make authentic followers of, fight, of Christ here and now, that we can be encouraged that you're going to reign in the end. There's glory coming, but right now we're in this training. Help us continue to live out what you've called us to do. Help us continually deny ourselves and carry our cross and follow you. 
In your name we pray. Amen.